Okay, did everyone have a chance to log in to the website to see the assigned meetings? Yes, no, maybe, perhaps. Did you log in to see the materials that you need to have ready for today? Anyone? I saw a number of people logged in because I received a email each time someone logs in because you download the materials. You need to print out those two chapters of the readings or go into the library and look at that particular book so that when you came to class and be ready for this page. This class is going to be reading heavy, which means I'm going to assign you reading expect it to read. That is what the message was for on the website. It's not going to be a lecture class where I lecture and give you notes. Those first two chapters, those three books that are listed there, are the books that we're going to use. Your part of the deal is to go and read whatever is assigned for you. It's always posted on that website so that you can get the information ahead of time. Any questions that are given to you test wise are going to come from those assigned readings. So if you fail to do the readings, you're going to miss out on a great deal. Not to mention, you're going to be coming to class unprepared if you have not read ahead of time. I explained that the last time we met here. The assigned readings that were given to you, two chapters from Walter Riley's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. This is a development studies class. So the first two chapters introduce you to the entire issue of chapter one, what is development, and how are we to understand underdevelopment. As we prepare to deal with that today, the first thing is that I mentioned to you that from time to time that we have material pulled out of the newspapers. So if we want to look at the state of development currently in Tanzania, I brought a few articles from current and slightly dated newspapers. This one comes from the February 6th to 12th edition of the Mirror. Out of the opinion section by Joseph Nihangu. Now Nihangu does excellent pieces. He's done pieces on, uh, this one here is entitled Cultural Liberation, Vital Economic Development. He's specifically dealing with Tanzania, but his piece addresses the entire continent. And what he tells us here in this piece is that if the culture, if development is not based in whatever the given culture is, then there's not going to be much development. He also gives you an interesting introduction into what development is all about. He says, the essence of politics is power. You remember last class here, we left off looking at what is power. You're going to understand development, you must understand power. You must understand that it is the duty of any educational institution to prepare students to be able to handle power correctly. So he says that the essence of politics is power, and power can be radiated either via its resource base, that means power can be ideological, economic, and punitive or through its structural setting by fragmentation, exploitation, and penetration. These six words that he gives us, ideology, economics, and punitive, as well as the issue of fragmentation, exploitation, and penetration, all have to do with development as it occurs within the African setting. He goes on to mention, to talk about the fact that right now we are economically dependent this is not an economic independence, but it's economic dependence. And he says dependence on external economic factors is a reflection of the country's inability to control and manipulate the operative mechanisms of an economic system. Ken supports the question of what is an economic system? Because we're talking about development. But if you don't have, regardless as to what you're talking about, if there is no actual definition of the concepts, you can't hold the conversation back. If you don't know what the words are, the first class period I gave you 10 
concepts used for the library and the science. Those are ten basic concepts that have to do with development. One of them was, what is development? The concept of development. Well, that's what he's telling us here. That you aren't, an economy is dependent, and there basically isn't any development, which is what Walter Rodney lets us know. That an economy is dependent specifically because people are not in control of the economic system. Then he talks about the fact that trade and interconnection with people. Anyway, it's an interesting piece because he winds it up telling us that all development must be based in a given people's culture. What is the culture of that country? Whatever the culture of that country is, development must be based on the culture. And as I said, uh, the mirror is an excellent little piece because whenever Mihanwa does a piece, he always relates it to the African set. He doesn't come telling you, hence he criticizes when he talks about the current level, the concept of development. When we say development, we're talking economic development. He criticizes the fact that we have a leadership class that is content with being dependent on the West. Need an idea, you go to the West. How should we, oh, we need expertise. You go to, get, go to recruit the experts from another country. So he's critiquing all of these things. Anyway, he says, uh, it's, this is very possible and practical. If not, what is the Tanzanian and the African elite and the super brains in general doing with its PhDs, its doctorates, or it's uh, philosophy, doctorates of philosophy, in the social and scientific field doing. If they are not basing everything that they're, supposed, they're dealing with in the culture of the people, if you leave here with an education and you can't go back to the village to speak to the people, your education is not prepared for what you have to deal with. If you leave out of the institution of so-called higher education and you can't con have conversations with the regular individuals that you see in town or across the country who've never been there, the education screws you up. Because if you're going to deal with the subject of development, you have to be able to talk to the people. So it's one thing to have a conversation with other folks who have the same education. But you've got to be able to take that information and translate it so that everybody else can understand what's going on. The ones who are actually going to be doing whatever it is that you're dealing with. And the project you're going to do it here, you can actually do an actual development project. Anyway, he says another problem is the language. If the education you're getting is not based in the language of the people that's supposed to be helping, it's going to be a problem. So, cultural development is key. That's what he's telling us. All right. Now, this one here is from the Daily News, July 6, 2012. This one is written by Mkwaya Kuhenga. And he tells us, he says, Tanzania and the South Africa paradigm. Are we dealing with poverty? Are we dealing with plenty? And basically, what he's, he starts off by telling us that if you've been following international news, you must have come across the effect that South African President Jacob Zuma is under considerable pressure from the rank and file of his party to nationalize the commanding heights of his country's economy. That is, the mineral resources, the land, and the banks. And he says, he goes on to talk about, he comes further, dealing with, he says, one does not need research statistics to understand all of this. One only needs to have a cursory bird's overview as one walks or drives in Dar es Salaam or elsewhere up country. Those people one crosses paths with, parking everything under the sun from spanner kits, handkerchiefs, bowls, and what have you, are actually an army of jobless youth who hardly make ends meet. These are hundreds, if not thousands, of able bodied youth who have taken refuge into Harkin. They are hawking all sorts of wares manufactured and produced elsewhere and not in this country. 
This is a reflection of the reality of the deindustrialization of this country with its resulting consequence, unemployment. Development, as you'll see in Walter Ryan, is supposed to be about the industrialization of a country. And by industrialization, we're talking nothing more than manufacturing. Manufacturing is the best way of saying this is the best way of saying making things with the resources available to you. Now, he says it is a price the country has had to pay following the abandonment of social social economic programs that were rooted in the public ownership and control of the country's commanding heights. We talked last week about resource nationalization. Everything you see occurring right now in South Africa is about nationalizing the resources. Uh, we saw the miners go on strike because they wanted a higher wage. Now all of those industries are controlled either by Afrikaners or by foreign companies from the UK other parts of Europe or the U.S., but they are not generally owned by South Africans. What the companies will do is they will go, they'll come into the country, and they will hire black South Africans just to give the company the face or the appearance of being But in reality, it isn't. And so, he's saying that also, he goes on to mention that uh, there's been an embrace of neoliberal economic programs. All right, and the last thing he goes, just to sum up the piece, he says, but how much I wish that today's mineral-rich Tanzania also owned equity shares of its abundant mineral resources. Because right now, you're finding the natural gas, you're finding the minerals of all sorts, and you're selling them off. The government, selling them off to foreign companies. And... The government of Tanzania doesn't own any shares in those companies. All right, he says, look here, Tanzania is no longer a spiteful, a passionate enough republic. He says, we are now both mineral and gas rich. They say, where there is gas, there is oil. Not only that, we have huge deposits of uranium in this country today. But who owns them? Development, if a country is to develop, the people of the country must own the resources. And people are beginning to realize that in South Africa now, 20 some years after the end of apartheid, their lives haven't changed. Oh yes, the lives of people who get an education and are able to get into government positions, their lives change. But the lives of the regular person, the average individual in the country, hasn't changed. He says, should such immense resources continue to be owned by multinationals, and Tanzanians winding up getting crumbs like a less to do author of a novel. Let us be serious. Our neighbors have begun to speak since out being in the late hours of the morning. You see that people have awakened in South Africa because now that the mining strike has come to an end, the farmers are striking. Because the land in the country was taken over by the Afrikaners. And even though you're not part of that ended, that's kind of still on the dirt of the best land. So development has to do with all these issues. And he's saying right here, right now, this country, Tanzania, and the rest of Africa are not on a path for development, but a path of poverty, continued poverty. That was this piece. All right, then you have another piece out of the August 24th to the 30th issue of the Mirror Digest. This is also behind what it means. He says the certain realities of African development. And I don't need to go through it again, but what he's basically telling us is that it's not reality. It's underdeveloped. Key term up here and one that you have listed. Everything that's occurring has to do with underdevelopment. He says that you're going to need specific types of policies that are engaged in development and you have to have a guideline for local resource development, resource ownership, all of those things that the country is actually going to develop. If you don't have that, 
He says, what you're going to have is uh, all these subjects might it must be guided by a policy of prudence and frugality in both the public and private sectors. It is only through such policies that we shall be able to participate as equal partners in development and restore our lost glory and dignity in the ever-growing hostile world dominated by the West, the cruel West, he sums up. But this is another excellent article on development, specifically Africa, uh, in which he also centers in on Tanzania, since he's campaigning, and papers publish it. He's pointing this out again. Development. Development. Now, I bring up these different pieces because these are today, 2012. Here's another one. Should Africa guard its hard won independence? This is from the November 19th and 25th edition of the Act. And once again, they're pointing out that with everything that's occurring now, there's been a, there's a selling off of African independence. You've got a lot of political and economic, I mean, political and religious conflicts. And so anyway, he says, before reaching to 100 years of independence, Africans are just doing the same mistake that took place in the colonial period. For instance, human trafficking is growing at high rate and some leaders get support from the whites, again, causing civil war. Civil war. It's modern slavery all over. So by, uh, by purposely seeking help from the West to undermine the government, for example, the MDC in Zimbabwe is supported by the United States, which is against the government. He says they're selling out independence. And in this one, efforts to still dealing with the issue of development. Efforts to make Africa feed its people succeeding. This is from this is also from the November 19th to the 20th edition of the Africa. And we mentioned last week that Tanzania is capable of feeding the entire continent. And but right now the African continent is not able to feed itself, but it is exporting tons of food to the West. You can go to any supermarket in the West and find fruit grown in Tanzania, fruit grown in South Africa, fruit grown in Ethiopia. And you look across the continent and you've got certain areas for people to start. It's not an issue, as the Hunger tells us in his piece, it's not an issue of lacking the resources, and also uh, what the writing tells us, it's an issue of uh, the focus on what people are calling development. And then he says, this one here is from the August 25th edition of the Daily News. This is by Mboneko Munyaga. He says, growing economic inequality risks tearing the nation apart. Since currently in Tanzania, you've got a massive wealth gap that is growing. You have people who are filthy rich. And then you have people who have nothing. You have people who, in this country right now, a small group of people who have millions of dollars and just stored up in the bank. And you've got people who are barely making it off of 1,500 shillings a month. So he's saying it's massive wealth. Anyway, if you'd like to read these, you know, I can get you copies. These are all from the local papers, and these are that they're dealing with the issue of development. I bring you all of that because everything that they're saying now, 2012, Walter Rodney tells us in his book, A Year of Underdeveloped African, Chapter 1. He specifically deals with the issue of everything that we just read here. Everything. So when you go and pull this down and read it, because your texts are going to come from the readings, you're going to see exactly what Walter Riley is talking about. Everything that we just read here, I just kind of ran through short in just a small amount here, Rodney pulls up in chapter one of A Europe Underdeveloped Africa, and the chapter is entitled specifically, the title of the chapter is some questions on development. And it's just two basic questions. What is development? What is underdevelopment? So first off, what is development? You know what development is because you are in the process of development. Look at human development. We start off as a sperm and egg, they get together, and then over the course of a nine-month period, they begin to grow. 
and develop into you eventually because we're in a constant state of development. We grow from that small sperm and that small egg, and the small sperm, the tiny sperm, and the egg into you. Going back to the example I gave last week of the seed. So human development, when we talk about the issue of development, we're basically expecting a country to go through a process of maturity. Just as we as individuals go through a process of maturity. Going from that small seed until you are now the individual that is before us and constantly in a state of development. You physically pretty much in your development around about the age of 25. But beyond that, you are constantly spiritually and mentally developing. So we're talking about development, and Walter Ryan declares in chapter 1 that you can look at development in a lot of different ways. You can look at development as an individual development. But let's look at how brilliant we are. But see, all of the stuff that I just read here, problems, or what uh, we heard we talked about in the other page back from back in February, by you know, the issue of the brain drain, people leaving, or we're talking about we need to bring in outside experts. There's absolutely no reason for anyone on the African continent to be having a need to bring in persons who have expertise. And here's why. In the night, dealing with human development as a model for the development of the country. This is a photocopy of the book, The Development of Psychology of the Black Child by Dr. Avis Wilson. So he's specifically dealing with the development of African children. Now the particular study that he cites was actually conducted in Kenya in the 1950s by a doctor named Bird. The background. The purpose of the study was because they wanted to show how um, the, the word I'm looking for, they wanted to show how primitive we Africans were compared to Europeans. That was the point of the study when they went to Kenya. But this is what they found out. They said that in the comparison of psychomotor development, we know what psychomotor development is. We're talking about your ability and your development as far as your mental abilities, physical abilities, all of that. So they said, it takes an African child nine hours in, eight in order for that child to be able to sit up and to be able to prevent his hair from falling back. So it takes nine hours for a black child to do that. It takes a European, European baby six weeks to be able to sit up and keep his hair from falling over. He says, in the study, and these are white doctors who are finding this out, they said that at two days old, a black child can hold the head firmly and can look you in the face and will be scrutinizing your face. And it takes a European child eight weeks to do that. He said, at seven weeks old, a black child can support herself in a sitting position and can actually watch her reflection in a mirror and know that that's her. And it takes a European child 20 weeks to be able to do that. It says, at five months old, we are completely and totally able to hold ourselves upright. It takes a European nine months to do this. All right, taking the round block out of this hole in the form of a bowl. So if you take an African baby and you give it the one of the little uh, children's names with the square pegs and the round pegs, at the, at the uh, five month period, an African child can put the round nose at the round piece goes into the round hole, the square piece goes into the square hole, the star goes into the star hole. We can do all of that. It has gained an ability to recognize the shapes of things that they make. And he said it takes a European child 11 months to do that. Uh, they tell us that at five months, an African child is, is able to stand up on its feet and gaze into a mirror. It takes a European child nine months. Seven months old, our children are walking, looking inside boxes, things of that nature. Takes your bitch out 15 months. And lastly, he says, at 11 months old, an African child can climb steps. And it takes your European child 15 months. Alright, so they say that this was their conclusion. 
The African babies actually seem to have been born in a more advanced stage of development, since many of their activities as less than a week corresponding to those formed by European children aged four to eight weeks. So when we look at that, and it's and it's true, it's, that should be the case that the African child is more developed than any other child on the globe at birth. That should occur simply because we've been on the earth longer. When we go back and we look at uh, human development and where life begins, life begins right here in the Great Lakes region on the African continent. 200 million years ago. So since, and 200 million years ago, everyone on the continent was that. So when you look at it like that, obviously we are supposed to be far more developed. We're born far more developed than other peoples. So there's no excuse, there's no reason for us to now sit down and be looking outside of the continent for ideas with, with old people on the planet. When you look at history, you've all taken history. When they sit down and talk about, when they talk about, a, you've got a professor at a University of Oxford, Chinese. Mean, he's done extensive books on the unity of African history. And the reason we mention history is because all people get their ideas for development from their own cultural history. You don't have to read it anywhere. We don't have to go to Europe to learn how to make steel. You were making steel here in the Great Lakes region 42,000 years ago. They only been making steel in, in years, for about 10, maybe 20,000 years. You've been doing it 42,000 years. The oldest economic system is subsistence economics, which means the focus is on feeding the family and not on trade. Prior to 500 years ago, the number one economic system, the number one means of economic development was Subsistence economy, economics. Subsistence e economics is not focused on international trade. Subsistence economics is focused on feeding people, clothing people, sheltering people. So the main focus is the domestic economy, the internal economy. Um, certain groups were nomadic, so they would trade with the settled farming communities. First farming communities, yeah. Everything that you see in the West, as far as development is concerned, is taken from Africa. Walter Riley, so, using human development as an example, because Africans are born so far more advanced than the other people on the planet, we don't need to go anywhere else to find out how do we do this. We don't go anywhere else to study uh, accounting. Why? You invented accounting. See, when you when you deal with development, as Walter Riley does here, and as they do in the curriculum that they put for development studies, you'll notice they specifically go and deal with history. Why? Because you need to know how things got the way they were, but more importantly, you need to know how you did things before things got all screwed up. Remember, capitalism is only 500 years old. So, first thing Walter Wright tells us about the whole issue of development, he says that it's a many-sided process, and at the level of the individual, development is supposed to mean increased skill and capacity, greater freedom, creativity, self-discipline, responsibility, and material well-being. Notice he put material well-being at the end. That's the last one. Because if you are increase your skills, if you increase your capacity to do things, if you have greater freedom, if you are creative and self-disciplined, and you have a sense of responsibility, you're going to develop the economy. But the key word is creativity. The Western scientists have what I say, the most important thing is not knowledge, the most important thing is imagination. Can you imagine something different from what you see. And if you can, what is the basis of that imagination? Where do, where do those ideas come from? So development is all of those things. Development is not just economics. It's not just getting things. If you just focus in on things, then you pretty much never 
be discussed into production and consumption. If that's your only focus is the material well-being. If that's your only focus, you're only talking about consuming and you're only talking about producing. But when you put in all the other concepts that he gave us, self discipline, do you have the self discipline to do what needs to be done? Do you? Do you have the sense of responsibility to do what needs to be done for the country itself? Yeah, that requires self discipline. Because think about it, you're going to get these degrees, and then some of you are going to start, you know, you're going to go further and get the master's degree, and you're going to get PhDs. You're going to become lawyers. You're going to start practicing law and doing all this wonderful stuff. And you're going to see those opportunities open up. Well, they have lots of opportunities in the West. You, you can, in, in these articles, they talk about the brain drain. The fact that most of Africa's experts, people get the degree when they go to Europe. They go to the U.S. Why? Because you can make much larger salaries in the U.S. But you very seldom see people do the reverse. You know, you be in the U.S., and then you leave because you got a sense of responsibility as an action. Even if you're from the diaspora, a sense of responsibility. Most folks don't go the opposite way because you got to have a self-discipline to decide that I'm going to do what's best for my people. Then you got to have a sense of responsibility to get up off your butt and go do it. And if you can do all those things, then you get the material well-being. And then he tells us that, see, when we talk about development, they'll think, you don't have to go anywhere else to go find out how to develop. Why? Because all people are in a constant state of development. You don't have to go anywhere else to find the ideas. We're in a constant state of development. All society, people, are, they get together, they form the groups, and then they decide, okay, you know, we're going to make sure that the entire group has A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That's a natural thing. You don't sit around and wait. Are you going to give us permission to do this? Is, and I think the examples I'm using are, these are the examples that they talk about here in these articles that governments in Asia and Africa pretty much do. They sit back and they're like, okay, majority of the farmers in Tanzania are women, and they're competing against Western multinationals. Now, we know we should subsidize them. We should provide them with all the equipment and stuff, because that's what they're doing in the West. But the IMF says you can't do that. What the hell? Why you? Think about it. Can you be a man and a woman in a house and make decisions in your house? Face so with somebody outside the house and say, I mean, is that how you're going to make decisions? You don't have the children, you don't make children, you don't have the children, but you're going to wait for permission from outside the house to do what needs to be done. That's what Mihanda, I, I love when I, when I see Mihanda speak, I love him because he doesn't tell you anything. He has another piece that in the brain that talks about traditional medicine. Who says traditional medicine is backwards? As a matter of fact, Western scientists were coming to Africa in the 80s. They were coming to the Congo. Specifically to the Bambuti, because the Bambuti were conducting brain surgery. Now, the Bambuti, uh, so I hear the term squat, but the Bambuti were, uh, you know, small people, sure. And so you come in, and they had this picture on the, uh, the magazine cover as a man with bone through the nose, what they were trying to say. You know, they, in the West, all the images in the West, when you look at the media of Africa, are negative. The idea is present, they present nothing but negative images. And all you have to do is go and sit down and analyze some the television stations you're getting from the West. Look at those negative images that you're getting from stations directly from the U.S. In the U.S., if you look at TV and you think a black person, you think criminal, on drugs, if it's a woman, then she's got lots of babies and she's very loose. The men are, are, are violent, rapists. Those are the images in the media. All right, so, me, but the me humble piece, the doctors from the U.S. are trying to figure out how could the Bambuti be performing brain surgery and they weren't using any modern, so-called technical, I mean, any modern um, medical stuff. Not only that, you would come and say, oh, say you got, you got some serious issues with your head. 
You come and see the bamboo the doctor, and he's like, okay, they're diagnosed. And then they, they, they lay out on the table, they mix up some herbs and knock you out. Then they would take their, their instruments and they would um, slice open the part of your, your head where you had the pain. They would uh, relieve the tension and then they would sew it back up. Oh, and the person would get up and walk away, maybe about two, three hours later. And nobody, they could do See, Mahanga, Mahanga, in his piece on traditional medicine, is saying all of the stuff that you go to the pharmacy to get, you are right down the trees. It's all around you. Because the Western companies will come here to the continent, and they will find a different thing, and they'll go back and put it together in a field. So in the West, if you've been eating a lot of crap, and you can't, your bowels are all messed up. You can go and buy you a pill that's made from an enzyme that's found in the pot. <clears throat> and then you take that pill and then suddenly your bowel movement is back to normal. So behind the showing, you don't have to go elsewhere to get the medical knowledge. And Wally who says that in one of his pieces, right after the end of this, like in about 33, 74, he makes a point. He said, we, we, we all caught up on the Western thing that it's only a hospital if it looks like it's, if it's a Western style hospital. Then we say, now we are developers. We just spent a million dollars. He said, the key things in medicine are cleanliness, cleanliness, cleanliness. It is. Somebody here had a toothache and they called their mother in the village. And they made them a stone, kind of a stone. So to put it under the tongue, put it under the tongue, you take your I was like, give me some of that. I mean, the natural medicine, medical remedies that exist are here. And so we have to point that out. But there has to be a focus on the African way of doing things for development to actually occur. And that's what Walter Rodney is hinting at when he opens up with development being more than material gain. See, because if we limit it to material gain, right now, Africa is a consumer. <clears throat> it's a very big consumer. And one of the pieces they talked about the continent being a dumping ground for, for junk from the West. And I mentioned to you the example of chocolate and how Western companies, if any country that's growing chocolate in Africa decides to want to produce chocolate and sell the finished product, they've got all kinds of tariffs and uh, whatnot that prevent that. Don't even allow it into their countries. So Walter Rodney again said that. He said, all people are going through development. Then he tells us what exactly is economic development. It's how you deal with your environment. Notice it does not say it's producing lots of this. Or producing lots of that for sale. He says economic development is a society develops economically as its members increase jointly their capacity for dealing with the environment. Jointly is a key word here. When you, as a group, deal with your environment, then you have to develop. As a group, you get together and do that. Not as an individual. And remember, the neoliberal creed, capitalism, Sales, individualism, so it's all about you, it's all about you, and you want to concern with yourself. But when we put it in the African setting, we're concerned with the group. We're concerned with the family, we're concerned with everybody. So anyway, it fails us that. And you create your own technology for doing things. You can't just wholesale for development, for example, uh, they want to bring in technology from the West. So you bring in tractors, you bring in this, you bring in that. The first problem with that, if you're bringing in all your technology from another place, the country you're in will never develop. Because those people are producing the stuff you buy. It's sort of like you have a military, and you say your military is there to protect you, but you've got to buy all your weapons from other people. If other people are selling you your weapons, then other people know you're capable. If you can't produce your own weapons, what kind of protection are you have? Same thing with technology as far as for uh, so-called technology that's being brought in, 
first off, it's not even good for the environment. Second off, it makes you dependent on the country that develops the technology. So they had an issue in the news with the uh, turbines they were buying from some country. Well, that was a big problem right there. So because you didn't, there was no one in the country that had expertise in that particular issue, nobody knew that the turbines were no good. Or they didn't need this, so they needed that. So they had to not only bring in the technology, but they had to bring in the experts to deal with the technology. So there could never be any development if that is the case. All right, now, Walter Rodney tells us that Africa being the current original home of man was obviously a major participant in the processes in which human groups display an ever-increasing capacity to extract a living from their environment. You look at your environment, and you, you decide, okay, how can I use this stuff in my environment to provide food, clothing, and shelter? Africa is the beginning, so that's what people first did. As a matter of fact, now I was at a, I was at the Saba Saba last year. Dar es Salaam they had these, uh, they were displaying Western artificial houses. You know, with all the, the uh, fake stuff. It's, it, none of it's real. It's just like, it's only lasted this long and it's also going to be good. But the key problem with that technology is it's not produced here. So, I mean, there's a high price tag that's imported in here, but they're trying to sell that off here. But this is what they're doing in the West. You can go to the UK, you can go to uh, America, and you'll see people building homes out of mud. So, and, and now where do they learn to use mud, engage in mud construction? They come here. Anywhere across the African continent, they study mud construction and they go back to the West. They don't call it mud construction, they use a Spanish term, adobe. You can buy yourself a nice adobe house. What is it? A mud house? It's a house made out of mud. So, they sell you fake stuff or stuff that will have you dependent on them. Then they come here to study how to use traditional African methods for building a home. Anyway, whatever it is that you're doing has to be adaptable to your environment. And that's what they've been getting at in these articles. That's what Walter Rodney gets at here in the book. Then he tells you, and we've heard this before, that generally, according to Marx's scholars, there are four stages of development. Communalism, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, and then finally socialism. Four stages. Uh, and social communalism is, is community based. And most people, they attack communalism. They say, hey, oh, communalism, they, they can't produce enough stuff. They all they tell you is that there was just so much poverty in communalism and blah, 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 on and on and on. They make it real negative. The key with communalism is that the societies were small, loosely integrated societies, and everything was focused on the production of goods for the society. So, which meant that everybody had their own, um, in a communal economic system, you, every family strived as much as possible to be self-reliant. Which means you're growing your own food. So, you go outside, and within the compound, you're going to see all of the basic things that you need. You're going to see livestock that people need, and you need that lot. Not only do you have, obviously, we have the cows, but we also have the ambrosia and whatnot, because you're using them not only for food or the milk from them, they're also using, like the sheep, we're not hung up, you're using them for the uh, making of um, textiles, the clothes. So everything was intended to be self-sufficient, as much as possible to be self-sufficient within each compound, in a communal setting. And then, remember now, all of your early African civilizations were founded on communalism. And what's interesting, when we look at history, and the more and more the people are looking at the civilization of the Nile Valley, is that they were highly agricultural, and they were producing, I mean, they were so sophisticated that they had methods for preventing the expansion of the desert. Because they were located close to the desert. Desert. They had sophisticated systems of irrigation, sophisticated uh, systems of public sanitation. When you go and look, you see modern looking uh, toiletry systems. 
in the systems. Minor looking methods for getting water into the systems. Every technology that you find in the West, they came to the continent and learned how to do it. And that's why you still see them coming around digging and digging deeply and, and looking at all these things. And then they go and write these technical studies geared for Western societies and they're gaining ideas on how to go and do other things. So anyway, communalism gets attacked because communalism doesn't concern itself with consumption. It concerns itself with necessary production first. So, and you'll notice when you, when you go back and look at the traditional African compound, there's a section in the compound for storage of your basic grains for protection against famine. So the idea was you provide all of these things within the compound. So you provide protection against a failed crop in the compound and all of these things. You also have small plots around the home to grow a diversification of crops. But then the government also had certain plantations, African governments maintained plantations, and they were growing food. Normally these plantations were associated with the religious system. And they were growing crops and whatnot for storage. And the governments were so sophisticated that they would have three, between three to ten years of food set aside or stored up in the event of some failure. For example, everybody in here, probably, everyone in here is either Christian or Muslim, so you've read the Bible, you've seen it in the Quran, you've got the example of Egypt there when uh, there was a famine in the land and they tell you that Abraham went down to Egypt. Abraham went to Africa to go buy some food. There was no other food growing anywhere else, and everybody was coming to Africa. Why? Because the people here had a sophisticated system of food production. Not grown. Now, you had people who were able, because you had this sophisticated system set up, and you started developing cities, then you can build universities. And so, you had some of the largest universities, 85,000 students. Here on the continent, producing all sorts of ideas and technologies and methods of doing things. So, the com and this is based on that first economic system, communalism. Communalism gets communalism is a key enemy to capitalism because capitalism is concerned with production for consumption, and then they use the fear of comparative advantage. And the idea is to, and oh, and then there's advertising. We spend a lot of resources to convince people you need this stuff. I mean, do we really need a cell phone? I mean, honestly, in all truth, do we really need a cell phone? What did you do before the cell phone? And somebody wanted to talk to you. And you weren't at your house with the house phone to talk to you. They just waited until they can get in touch with you, until they saw you. But like now we say, we need this cell phone. We need the iPhone. We need these things. And actually, we've been convinced we need them. We've been convinced that we can't live without our cell We gotta have it. I mean, do I really need to be able to watch a video on my cell phone? Or a whole movie? It's not a need, but we've been convinced. In a capitalist society, the focus is on producing things and convincing people they need these things and then getting people focused on a money economy. Because the communal economic system is not based on money. You don't need money for the most part. Communal systems are pretty much based on barter. And there will be some means of uh, something will serve as a form of money. For example, in West Africa, and during the European Middle Ages, the European Middle Ages are the classical golden age after civilization. It was like the second golden age, actually. Second or third, something like that. Our history is just that long. But, people weren't running around trading the uh, gold and stuff for money. Think about when you took history, I don't remember when you would have studied this, what uh, that was, 
But uh, one three, one four, whatever. But when you study history and they tell you about Mansa Munsa from West Africa, he went on a hodge and he took so much gold with him that he devalued the price of gold across the Muslim world. Gold was not being used as a currency in Africa. We have so much of it here, it's pretty much worthless. So, but now if you went to Mansa Munsa's kingdom at the time, the currency was salt, because salt was scarce. So people were, everything was valued in terms of salt. Also across the continent, people had used cowrie shells. So that things were valued in terms of cowrie shells. Not to mention, the whole concept of writing checks and receipts is an African concept. There's an excellent book, it's called Whitley Rule. I forgot the uh, author's name right now. I have a copy of it, but he just goes across the whole continent and shows all of the things that you think are modern. They aren't modern, they're actually African. From out of history, other people go and like, oh, let's go see what they were doing. And then they take notes, and they come back and they say, aha, I've got a new system. We're going, you had a guy at a university over in the U.S. And it's called, uh, it, it, it's called, he, he's created some type of economic system. Then he came to the continent selling it as a means to help poor people to develop. That's how he put it. But the system, the economic system that I can't think of right now, is actually based on African communalism. Because when you say communalism, you're talking about African communalism. So, because communalism focuses on self realignment and capitalism, wants you to be a consumer, there's a class. The good thing about Africa is that the majority of the continent is still pretty much based on a subsistence economy. There's nothing wrong with subsistence because you should, as a man and a woman, you are supposed to be concerned first and foremost with your family having the basics that are necessities. You want nutritious meals, you want proper clothing that meets whatever the weather is, the atmosphere, and you want good, clean shelter. And I mean, if I had a, a projector, I could just show you some of the types of houses and they came over here instead. You see the houses they were building in the UK, instead of going and using concrete and whatnot, they've taken portions of trees and they've shaved them down and they've polished them and they and they've created these entire mud homes and all kinds of stuff. And I actually have a book on one of them. And then when I look at it, I say, oh, I've seen it. I've seen it in Cameroon. So I've seen it across the continent. Where they, they, they really start to study and say, okay, you know now, thatch roofing allows the home to be warm in the winter and it allows the home to be cool in the summer. So we're going to use thatch roof. But then you come over here and they're selling folks tin. Anyway, these folks, that's why communalism is an enemy to capitalism for that purpose. In a capitalist system, in a capitalist global system that is currently constructed, African states are dependent on the Western economy. And since there's that dependency relationship, Walter Wright tells us something good, and I'm not even going to try and mess up what he said, but I'm going to give it to you exactly as he could. When he talks about dependency, he uses the example of the child and the parent on dependency. And he says, here you go. Uh, all right. All right, he says, African economies are integrated into the very structure of the developed capitalist economies, and they are integrated in a manner that is unfavorable to Africa and ensures that Africa is dependent on the big capitalist countries. So that there's a news article that was talking a few months back that said, um, because of the global slowdown, it was saying the Tanzanian budget was going to suffer because it is highly dependent on foreign aid so there wasn't going to be enough money to do some projects. That's a dependency relationship. Or there's a global slowdown in the West, so since here, 
everything is based on monocrops. And uh, that's what the one article, he was saying that Anthony is no longer a cashew or slice of economy. That means that most of the foreign exchange is learned from slice of plantation to cashew plantation. But regardless, all African countries are based on monocrops. So they're growing cocoa export, growing apple export, oranges export. Uh, it's some big crop. And so you'll come to a country for corn, and you'll start seeing large corn plantations. Last time I checked, local population can't just eat corn all day. I mean, Ugali is good, but you need something else besides the other ones. You gotta have some vegetables. You gotta have a lot of other stuff. But if your economy is a monocrop, crop, and because it's a capitalist system, who can afford to pay the most money for all of the crops that are grown? People in the UK, people in the US, so they export it. So you've got right now, right, um, periodically, you know, we see with Ethiopia, they tell you that Ethiopia is uh, suffering from famine. Uh, in the mid-80s, you had famine that struck Mali, you had famine that hit um, Chad, all of those countries across the Sahara. Right where the Sahara Desert returns into the African savannas, all of those countries got hit with a drought. But if you look at economics like I do, you start to notice that all those countries were net food exports. They were exporting food and their population was starving. So if you look around in African, the continent, you see a country that where people don't have enough to eat, that same country is exporting kind of food to the West. That's a dependency relationship. That's a relationship for imperialism. Look back at history. And Walter Rodney does that in chapter 2 that we'll look at tomorrow. But when the Romans invaded Egypt, not the Romans, when the Greeks invaded Egypt, Egypt was the breadbasket of the world at the time. They were growing so much food, they were feeding, yes, that had desert strip of land, nothing but desert, and they just farmed it along the Nile River. But that whole Nile Valley was feeding, was growing enough food to feed themselves and export to the rest of the world. And you're talking about 10, 8 to 10,000 years ago. When the Greeks, when the first the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then followed by the Romans invaded, they changed the economic system. They started putting a heavy tax on the food to be grown, and the crops were being shipped to Europe. First the Greeks, with first the Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. And so that now, within the African heartland, you started having issues of people starving. Normally, you only have you only have issues with the population not having enough to eat when you have political instability. When you have and political instability, either it's internal political instability, a civil war, or you have the issue of an invasion and the country loses. So you start to see. Go back and read some of the old histories again and notice what you see them taking out. Out of that, after conquest, they take out people, free labor, slaves, running as labor, and they start taking out all the livestock. They take out all of the people who have a good education. Yes. They take out all of the crops and ship them back to their country. These are the things that happen under the period of the Right now in Africa, you got people get education, they go west. But they're going to people who are supposed to be able to have skills to improve them. People who are poor and can't find work here, no industries, the industrialized now, they go to Europe. Before, we were going and change. Now we're going and we end up in Europe working as prostitutes in some type of crime or very low paying jobs. Because when you run away to Europe, think you are in the US, the thing you must understand is once you get there, they're not going to pay you the same thing as the other folks. They're going to offer you a job and they know that a person from the US won't take, but it's going to seem like a lot of money to you compared to what you were looking at over here. So
So they use that labor from the continent to force down wages in their own country. That's still slavery, it's just under a different name. And we're still exporting all of the crops out, but still in the period of slavery. So even though politically it says we have independence, in reality, you can't develop under that situation. And that's what Walter Rogers points out. He says, uh, when a child or the young of any animal species ceases to be dependent upon its mother for food and protection, it can be said to have developed in the direction of maturity. So, when you're a man, uh, as a male, as a man, when you stand up and you say, no longer will I eat food that comes from the table of my mother, but I will now provide food for my mother, you are now what? Independent. And you are a producer, because that's the purpose of the male. We're supposed to be producing. We're supposed to go out and do all the job production. The female, she does all the managing. If you look at African societies, the, uh, the Greeks when they came, the Romans and other peoples, when they went to the African market, they didn't see men. They saw the women in the market. Well, who else, who would better know what the house needs than the woman? Man, I remember growing up, my dad would never know anything about the house. He was out producing, he was making stuff. When the house needed repairs, he was making all the repairs, he did all that stuff. He was earning income and bringing it to the home. He would go and get the food, whether they went hunting or they went fishing, or he went and purchased it, and he would bring it home. But once all this stuff got there, my mama did everything else. In African settings, the women are the ones who make the best economic decisions because they're the ones who, who all of the children, whether they grow up, they're first. The mom. So in a tradition of African cultures, markets were generally controlled by women, not men. Uh, the man was supposed to be the producer. So if you look at a country, they tell you the statement that said, if you want to know the state of a country, look at the state of the women. Look at the state of the women. If the women are highly educated, the country will be highly educated. If the women are not educated, the country will not be educated. Because the mom is the first system of education. You learn language, children learn language first from the voice of mom, not daddy. You know, after we produce, we'd be helping make the baby and everything, you know, when we there with the baby born, then we got to get back up and get back out in the fields, get back out of the business. But you were there with the children. You're more likely to see the baby on the mother's back than on the father's back. You occasionally will see that, but most of the time it's really on the mother's back. So if you want to know the state of the place, look at the state of the women. And then, if you want to know the state of the place, what are the men doing? If the men are consuming, the place will be poor. If the men are producing, the place will be wealthy. Because they will be producing what is needed first. Then they'll start turning their attention to other stuff. And so that's what Walter Rodney is telling us in that piece. He said, dependent nations can never be considered developed. It is true that modern conditions force all countries to be mutually interdependent in order to satisfy the needs of their citizens. Because some things you can't grow here. Well, in Tanzania, not too much can grow here. But in some places, like in Europe, that land ain't good enough to grow none of us would take it. And it can feed some cows. So you'll notice that the tradition of European diet was meat and potatoes. That's why. Didn't nothing else grow there. When you go to Europe and you start to look at and you see all that produce, and you that's not grown in Europe, it's grown in Africa, grown in Asia, shipped to Europe. When you come to the US, they got a lot of farmland, but there's still a lot of stuff that don't grow in an in, in, in American climate. And even though the U.S. is highly, has so much farmland, they still import tons of food because, you know, they want the luxury items. You know, they import the papaya. They import passion food. You know, all that type of stuff. So there has to be interdependence, but that does, but, um, but that's not incompatible with economic.
economic independence. You can be dependent on other countries for some things, but still be economically independent. Especially in Africa, because land is so fertile. Land is so fertile, we don't even use all of the land. We got more land than people. So you can be economically independent. You should never depend on anyone, as far as the government is concerned, for the necessities of life. No. Never, you don't ever want to be dependent on people for your clothes, your food, or your shelter. Especially your food. Food is number one. Never be dependent on those three basic things. Those are always, oh, and your weapons for your military. Don't want to be dependent on other people for your ability to defend yourself. Another one of those um, duties that you generally, responsibilities that generally fall upon men. Protection. So you'll notice in most African societies when they separate the men out, and they take one of the things that, that, that we're being taught is uh, how to protect, defense, warfare, which is a natural necessity. Because everybody ain't your friend. So then he goes on and tells us, it does however require a capacity to exercise choice in external relations, and above all, it requires that a nation's growth at some point must become self-reliant and self-sustaining. If your growth is based on stuff you brought from the outside, you will never become self-reliant and self-sustaining. Self a self-reliant people are called people. A self-reliant people can sustain themselves. But a people that are dependent on others for things can't sustain themselves. And that's what he's telling us in chapter 1. So he says, it is also true that the West is dependent on Africa. Trust me, if suddenly the DRC had a viable government in a Tanzania and all the countries right across, stretching from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic across a certain part of the continent, decided to stop exporting all of the minerals and the uh, plants and all of that that are used in the West to make medicine, they have problems in the West. So that's a weakness for the West, the fact that it's not Africa that's poor, it's not African people that are poor, it's just the Western countries that are poor. They just turn everything upside down and make the people who are rich think they're poor, and then they make the people who are poor think they're rich. They just flip the everything upside down on top of the city. And so he tells you that the weakness of the current economic system is that they're dependent on the rest of the world. In other words, but in place of their dependence, they export their technology. So they convince you you need their technology to do, to use. Zimbabwe, and there's a study that was published in the U.S. I have a copy of it. Uh, it was talking about the fact that Zimbabwe, it, it, it kind of agriculture, it kind of, it's kind of based on agriculture, and its farming is based on a communal style farms, small farms. And they have exceeded the production of commercial farms. Because, see, nobody ever asked the question does industrialized farming actually perform better than small scale farming? It doesn't, but no one had ever asked the question before. The assumption was that, oh, we just got to do commercial farming and then we'll be able to feed our people. That's a lie. Zimbabwe has proven this a lie today. But Africa proved that was a lie several thousand years ago by feeding an entire population of people in the hundreds of millions. All right, so anyway, folks, that was some of the stuff he talks about in uh, chapter one, and then he goes into why we are dependent on the technology, we're accepting that technology. He says religion, religion was used as a means for cultural penetration. Then he talks about education, Education is the key, because today you've got political independence. If you had an actually educated uh, workforce, I mean, actually educated people, then the idea to be coming. But we don't have an educated people, we have a trained people. And there's another book here, it's by Martin Carnot, it's called Education and Cultural Imperialism. We've been told, you get a good education, 
Then you may be disrespectful to the job, then you may be providing uh, certain things you need, blah, 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 blah. But the type of education you get actually is a dependent education. It's an education based in Western traditions. And wherever your mind is, that's where your body goes. So if you've been educated according to Western standards, Western information, you're going to eventually want to go to the West. And that's what Mark Carno points out in this book. And on page 18, in the first chapter, he says this. Uh, when we, we argue then that the purpose of Western school, that's your international schools, and that's the, any education system you take out of the West and don't change it. The basic, there are certain things that must be changed. And he says, Western schooling, if it was instituted around the world, was to make people useful in the new hierarchy, not to help them develop social relationships which carry them beyond that social structure to others. So schooling does not help people reach stages beyond a capitalist system. We define this as the colonizing aspect of school. Transformation from traditional to capitalistic hierarchies occurs at least in certain sectors, but the tools of change are not taught in schools. Neither children nor adults are brought to understand their relationship to institutions and how they can change those institutions to suit their needs. Education is supposed to teach you, help you to develop your ability to think so that you can interact with your environment and do what you need to be done. Economics is not what's written in an economics book from the West. Economics is what your environment dictates to you. These books that I have here, Economic Development, Education, Cultural Pluralism, Black Power, How Europe Really Developed Africa, these are not infallible. These are merely ideas. You are supposed to, as an educated person, be an idea person. You know why they call a doctor of philosophy a doctor of philosophy? Because that person is supposed to understand the underlying basis of things. The philosophy that underlines it. It's ontology. It's etiology. Those things. The foundation of the idea. And then as a doctor, you're supposed to be developing laws. In a social science, you're supposed to be developing the laws of the social construction of your society. You're supposed to be generating ideas. Which means you need to know how to question them. Which means you have to have thinking skills. That's what education is supposed to do. Education is not what Paulo Freire said in his book. Um, <coughs> uh, Paulo Freire's quote here. He tells you what he calls uh, he calls the current education the banking system. He says it's a culture of silence. Notice what the British system of education, which the Sandanian system of education is based on, encourages. It encourages silence. So you come into the educational system and you're supposed to sit down and be silent and listen to the lecture. Because the lecturer is the prophet of the system. And he brings you the infallible knowledge and wisdom that you will need. No. He said the colonial element in schooling, this is Paulo Freire, and he said the colonial element in schooling is its attempt to silence, to rationalize the irrational, and to gain acceptance for structures which are oppressed. Such colonization does not require imperialism. Since one class can colonize others, men can colonize women, whites can colonize blacks, and so forth, all within an imperial nation, or all within a given nation, so that there isn't any real education because there isn't any thinking. You know, in religion, we're supposed to go to and you accept the holy book as the holy book, and the word holy comes from the word complete, which means that book is supposed to have everything you need to live. And that's the idea that's 
charge starts for education. And when you come into an institution, the one thing that's good about the American system is you're expected not to come in and sit down and be quiet. They're trying to move to a regimented system, but you're supposed to come in and have questions. You're supposed to come into the room thinking that your ideas are good, whether they are or not. You are supposed to be coming in with ideas into any class. Because there's more, you are, remember now we talked about the sophisticated development that you have the African person. You don't come into a room and then you sit still and, and they, they, like, they open your head and they pour all the information in, they close your head, shake it up, give you a test, and you stay back at it. You took really for that. We are much more brilliant people than just that. The American system does encourage you to come in and say, why? That's the most important question you can ask. Why? Why is that the most important thing? And you know what? Nobody has to teach you that. It's why. When you were born and you began to learn, you've been learning all your life. The first question that came out, why? Why did you? Everything. Anybody here have children? You tell your child something? Your child, what's the next question? Come back. Then you give them another answer and they say, why? That is the most important question. And the next step in thinking, once you don't underestimate the power of why. If somebody comes to you with an idea, why? Why should I believe that? Why is what you're saying true? Why do you believe that that's true? Why? Why, why, why is it the most powerful tool you have in your arsenal? Why? And then the other thing is, anything somebody's telling you, there's an alternative point of view there. There's another point of view. So if they say, this is the truth, there's the opposite to that. Now, why isn't the opposite the truth and what you told me tonight? So you got to start asking questions. And that's what Muhammad, Muhammad and everybody else did. Munyaka, all of these articles I brought to that, that's basically what they did now. Chen Weizu, a scholar from Nigeria, and if you Google Chen Weizu, you'll see tons of articles that he's written talking specifically about African development. Tim Wayne said one thing. Uh, in an interview with a newspaper, they were saying, well, and it was young people, because Tim Wayne doesn't waste his time talking to people my age. Tim Wayne was like, you know, folks my age, they're pretty much set in their ways. So you know when, you know, you know, they have a proverb about the West, you can't use old dog newspapers. You know, it's old, you ain't getting you nothing new. All right, so he goes with the young folks. And so the students that they were interviewing me, they said, okay, well, well, you keep telling us all of this stuff that the Nigerian government is doing is wrong. What should we do? He said, that's not my point. That's not my purpose here. My purpose is not to tell you what to do. Because that leaves you dependent on me. He said, my point is to get you to ask the right questions. So if someone says, you need to do this, you need to study A, B, C, D, and E so you can get this degree. The right question is not, where do I sign up? Or where do I buy the books? <laughs> the right question is, why do you say I need to study that in order to do this? That's the right question. See, that why question leads you on to the rest of the day. And so, what he's saying here in this book, and he's got some great chapters specifically looking at education in Africa and how it was not designed to make you think. I had a professor here, a lecturer, he said, because I specialize in critical thinking. If you look at my office door, I say, I can't teach you about anything. I can only make you think. That's it. And the best way to make people think is to do stuff that you really angry. So if I, I once taught a class and all of the students were very conservative, so they were conservative Christians and they were white. So what I did was I would bring nothing but ideas. If they were Christian, I was like, 
I started to just critiquing your religion, asking, stating all kinds of ideas that were against the religion. And these were young kids, so they became angry. They were upset. Why are you saying that? Yeah, I got my response to you. you know, I said it right away. The religion, the politics that they heard from their parents, and that made them go out and start to read it why they were believing this. And then they would come in to me, and so when I started talking to them, they had reasons why they believed this. They were based on facts and not just like a little bird stuff that would kind of flew in and flew out. And this book here, Education Culture and Fear, doesn't tell you what you think the education you're getting and doing is not doing that. But then it tells you, gives you ideas on how to develop the type of system. You can one. Excellent book. Now, this book ain't new. This book was written in 1974. This book was written in 1974. Walter Rodney, everything he puts in the first, talks about in the first chapter that we just read today, but Walter Rodney wrote this book in Tanzania while he was at the University of Dar es Salaam, originally in 1972, is when it was published. So he wrote it, he was in Tanzania from 69 to 71, and he came back. And the book was published by the East African Publishing uh, East, by East African Publishers Ah, I forget the name, but it's in the building is still standing in Dasalon. And uh, but everything he's saying here, they're still talking about it now. And the reason they're still talking about it now is because, as Walter Ryder said, education is another key reason that dependent exists. Because all of the education is coming from the people you're dependent on. So all of the textbooks are written by the people that the country is dependent on. So you get an entire education and you merely learn to think like them. So you say economics is, I had this discussion here with someone, they were saying, well, this is what economics is taught all over the world. I said, who the hell said that that's economics? That's economics if you're in the U.S. or if you're in Europe, the last time I said, exactly. We need that. We have been banned we down here in Great Lakes region. What do you mean this is economics? Economics here, we just ain't thinking economics there. Think about it. Land is not scarce in Africa. We got way more land than we need to be. So land is not a scarce resource. But if you're in the United States, if you're in Europe, sure. If you're in the UK, land is scarce. We got like 80 some, 100 some million people on that island. Land is scarce. If you're Japanese, 100 some million people on an island. Land is scarce. Here's land is not scarce. Population density is low. So that means your economics is going to be totally different when you start looking at the basic elements. Much different. The economics is going to be totally different. And that's what they are pointing out here. And uh, that's what he's pointing out. He's specifically dealing with the education and why it's not the type of education. Because you're not prepared to do things differently. And he puts that here. He says, in this book, we argue that what you think of education is not education. He says that educators, social scientists, and historians have misinterpreted the role of Western schooling in the third world and in industrial countries themselves. We argue that far from acting as a liberator, Western formal education came to most countries as part of imperialist domination. It was consistent with the goals of imperialism, the economic and political control of the people in one country by the dominant class in another. The imperial powers attempted through school to train the colonized for roles that suited the colonizers. Even within the dominant countries themselves, schooling did not offer social inequities. The educational system was no more just or equal than the economy and society itself. Specifically, we argue because schooling was organized to develop and maintain in the imperial countries an inherently inequitable and unjust organization of production and political power. You got an education for somebody else's benefit. And so, when you get it, some people, they want to go to those places because that's what education is designed to take you. Or when you get it and you stay here, you do exactly what the colonial government did. Exactly. 
The colonial government provided over a monocrop economy. And Tanzania is still not a monocrop crop economy. So we still have people who are trained in the West. One of them called it, he's like, he said, he's pretty much tired of uh, intellectual populism. He said, we got the University of Dar es Salaam here, when, what they was talking about. But they kept doing nothing more than spitting out ideas from the West. They weren't creating any new ideas. Because their education was based on something they had gotten from the Soviet Union or from the UK or the US. So when the country transitioned to multi party democracy in 1992, and then they started to throwing away uh, the socialist paradigm, they started to bring in textbooks from the United States. So suddenly you had a lot of people who studied all these economic issues from the US, and now they're going to apply it. Just like it is in Tanzania. Problems. What's the problem? The same thing that uh, he points out right here in this article. Um, or right here. The same thing. The problem is when you took the Western concept, you got growing inequality, risk of nation problem. In the United States, you got massive inequality. You just don't see it. See, most people in America are poor. They don't know they're poor. Because they got all the things they think they need or want. So you can go in the U.S. and you can pass by a house that looks like it's about to fall in. Like the roof is like barely sitting there, the wind comes blow it over. I mean, the house is just horrible, it's nasty. But outside you see this nice brand new car. And then the people who come out, oh, they're so nice and well dressed in all of the Western clothing. And you'll see them on their iPhone, the latest iPhone, whatever the latest phone is, iPhone, whatever it is, 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 those people are poor. How do you know? Because when that family, when they, that paycheck that they're getting and no longer get paid, then suddenly they can't afford their car, they can't afford this, they can't afford that. They're tied to that paycheck. Those people are poor because when you look at the necessities of life, medicine, you need a lot of medicine in the West if you eat that Western diet. They can't afford medicine. They don't have health care. People are poor, they just don't know. It just looks, when you watch television, you look at the movies, it just looks like these people got a lot of stuff. You don't. And so, when you brought wholesale economic books from the UK and the US, 20, almost 20 years later, you got this stuff. Growing economic inequality. You got, not seeing some people, I'm like, excuse me. Stand yourself to be that happy, just to be so excited to have that much money the way you got it. And yet, when you drive home, you drive past people who may, don't know where the next meal is coming. Because here, people don't go in, in America when they get a lot of money, they run away and they don't want to live around the court. So they go to their own special neighborhood, gate. They got a whole gate neighborhood, and they got security guards, and you can't come in. You know, they don't want you to even see inside their neighborhood. That's what the wealthy people do. But here in Tanzania, they just go and build a house right there. So they build this nice big house, and you got all these people around, and they got nothing. I mean, how can you even live with yourself and you got this? There's something wrong with it. If you got a system that allows, that celebrates one person being very wealthy, it celebrates that. How can you celebrate greed? You can't according to African traditional ethics, but you can according to Western to, 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 uh, ethics. It's exciting, you know, yes, I, I have worked my way up. I would feel sad if I improved myself in the world. I mean, I did nothing for my family, nothing for mama. Mama had me nine months. Mama, mama breastfed fed me for however long. Mama did this. When I, when I got, I was born sick, so mama took care of me. Daddy went and provided clothes and food and shelter, taught me what it was to be a man and all this thing. How can you not do for your parents? That doesn't even really make sense. But in the West, you can. In the West, you know, you, you, you build what's called an old folks home. It's actually called the elderly retirement center. Really, it's a place where you throw away old people. And people literally do this. They take their parents and they put them in this place and some people watch over their parents and they visit their parents, you know, once a week, something like that. 
I told my parents, you're going to the whole for something. They say, when y'all can't do for yourself, you come in wherever I'm in, wherever that is in the world. Anyway, you have this problem because you had an education that created the problem. The education didn't solve the problem. The education specifically maintains the problem. Imperialism created it. And most of when we talk about development, and when you look in the newspapers, and they're talking about poverty, and they're talking about all these other things, those are the symptoms of underdevelopment. That's the symptom. So most people will focus on the symptom. And if you focus on the symptom, you never, you haven't addressed what caused the symptom. So, if you come up here and you say, and you see this a lot, any country that's developed, we call it a developing country. Somebody that has some great development project that's going to do something wonderful, something great, going to help everybody. We got a new way of teaching. We got a new uh, way of growing crops. And so you say, once we do this, we're going to have this problem with because we're, you know, we're now we're a middle income country. We won't get money to do. But the project always addresses the symptom of it. And Walter Rodney, in chapter one of how you're going to develop Africa. He points out that uh, most of what people are calling development is just looking at the symptom, but they have not in any way addressed the actual issue. He says, when the experts from capitalist countries don't give you a racist explanation, you know they're Africans, they can't do it. Then they will tell you, they nevertheless confuse the issue by giving as causes of underdevelopment the things that are really consequences. Poverty is a consequence of underdevelopment. So if you focus in on reducing poverty, you have an address why you underdevelop. He says, uh, for example, they would argue that Africa is in a state of backwardness as a result of lacking skilled personnel to develop. It is true that because of the lack of engineers, Africa cannot, on its own, build more roads, bridges, and hydroelectric stations. But that is not a cause of underdevelopment, except in the sense that causes and effects come together and reinforce each other. The fact of the matter is that the most profound reasons for the economic backwardness of a given African nation are not to be found inside the nation. All that we can find inside are these symptoms of underdevelopment. You can look at it inside your head all day long. You're never going to find why the country is underdeveloped inside. The issue is outside the country. So, anyway, and that's what he points out looking at the wrong place. Looking at the wrong place for the cause of the development situation. Poverty is a symptom, a lack of expertise is a symptom. The fact that people get wealthy within a country after they start working for government is a symptom of underdevelopment, not the cause of it. It's a symptom. The cause is the, as it addresses it, the economic dependence of here. And notice what he says. He does not say Africa is completely underdeveloped. He says economic underdeveloped. Ethically, Africa is far ahead of the West. Ethically, I am because we are. In the West, I am before I am. So in the West, it's an individual basis. In the West, it's anybody who thinks like you based, and so you all get together and you manipulate your control power. Ethically, not behind, not underdeveloped. Highly developed, man. Highly developed. Creatively. The creativity is all out here. You see it all the time. From the man who built his own car from scratch here in Tanzania, to the young man in Malawi who developed his own system of uh, electricity, system for electricity, to uh, the young man in the African diaspora in the U.S. who pioneered a new uh, open heart surgery method. The boy is 14 years old. African child. Or the two Nigerian kids who um, have mastered all levels of mathematics and they're like 10 years old and they've done calculus, economics, all that stuff. 
creativity we have, genius we have, all of these things we have to them. Once we get back in touch with who we are, we have to reconnect with our own selves culturally in order to bring out that realness. And that's why he mentioned so highly they address. That's why the mind talks about cultural liberation. When you liberate yourself culturally as Africans, when we're liberated culturally as an African, we do things far and above other people. And what they do? Way above. Yes. And that's why this is a nice piece that he wrote on the cultural liberation. Because when you turn to your culture, when we as Africans go back to our culture, oh, we do some great stuff there. We do great things. But when we try to take European culture, we look like the old problem, uh, the old statement, monkey see, monkey do. You ever notice, I don't know if you've heard the story, but you got the, uh, you got the man who trained the monkey. And you've seen the scientists, they get off, they have the monkeys and they train them. They say that in Western science, they say man is related to the ape, the monkey, and whatnot. So they go and study the monkey, quote unquote, understand how man is that. I know it's weird, it's not a fairy tale, but that's what they really do in the call of science. So, they go and they study this, and so, you know, the, the, the monkey will imitate what the people are doing, you will, uh, do they say I'm eating, they will imitate them eating, do all these things. And then in the West, they create these comedies where the monkeys will put on suits, and their shirts and ties, and carry briefcases, and he's imitating the man the whole time. The scientist is imitating the scientist. But the thing with imitation is, with the monkey, the monkey is never respected with the man, by the man, as being an equal. Because the man knows the monkey is a monkey. The monkey doesn't forget it's a monkey. The monkey not thinks it's a man. Because it's trying to adapt the man's culture. You know, the lesson we can take from that is if we just keep, and in the West, when someone says you're imitating them, they say you're aping them. Because that's what, based on a scientific explanation, they're looking at the study. So, if I'm in the United States, and I'm clearly African, but yet I'm trying to be like a European, that's going to be a problem. A long, you're going to have all kinds of problems. First of all, you're never going to be respected as a European. Because you're not a European. So, that person who's imitating, they don't have any selfish, first they don't respect themselves and they don't get respect to the people that imitate. You, if you had anyone just trying to be just like you, you know how annoying you make When you have children, at first a child might start to imitate you, but eventually you're going to encourage the child to develop themselves because they can't do everything exactly like you. They have to give their own unique contribution to the earth. When we turn to our culture, we really do some stuff. We start teaching Christians how to be Christian. We teach Muslims, my name is how you really be Muslim. You ain't, you ain't got the right to Yeah, I love the term, do they? That's when we turn to our own culture and use our culture as a language. Think about it. Think about it. And development has to be based on culture liberation. We must be proud to be happy, excited. We got to stop bleaching ourselves. You know, skin bleaching cream. We got to stop. I was going to read something in the news. Um, but this, they were doing like the story came out of West Africa. That some lady was trying to enhance certain vital features, and the she went to somebody that really wasn't a doctor, and they injected her with something that really wasn't an injection. And she ended up having to have her arms and her legs amputated. We gotta stop all of this Western imitation and be who we are. Because then that's when our brilliance comes out. Then that's when we improve ourselves, we improve the country we live in. It's key. And that and all begins in culture. And that's what the hunger is pointing out. African culture. That's what Molly Molly was kept pointing out. I've got three of his books, and every time I'm reading, he keeps coming back too. We that's why I noticed. He wasn't doing 
socialism. He didn't go into socialism. He said, African socialism. We are a socially based people and we think within the group, so we want the entire group to perform because I can't be happy as you're not happy. So, what he was doing with the Shabbat was basing it within all of the positive aspects of traditional African culture, traditional African community. That's what's going on. We hunt for a and a lot of these other and when you, as we keep going through and we look at different newspapers, they keep coming back to that same point. Wholesale grabbing of ideas from the West does not lead to development. It maintains dependence. The only way you develop is when you break away from it. And when you turn inwardly and focus and, and base everything you're doing in your own culture. Consensus. African democracy. African cooperative economics. The group helping the group progress. Based in our own culture. I don't care what part of the country you come from, we all have but we got a lot of cultural commonality. And that's what that piece is, and that's why I brought it in, because it's so important. This is where culture, and in the economic system, for the last thing for today, an economic system is a culture. And out of a black power, this is what Dr. Wilson is telling us. He's saying, look, uh, Economics, an economic system is ultimately a social system. A social system is ultimately a cultural system. So you have to have your own system. And that's every aspect of it. Which means, once you study law, you are supposed to be in your duty, because when you get a law degree, you now have a jurist doctor. That means you are now a doctor of law. So you're supposed to come up with African customary laws. And you have to base it in the culture. So you, that means you're redefining the legal system in line with African cultural values. That becomes your contribution as future laws. That's your contribution. That means you get yourself out there and you do these things. Because coming back to Quantum again, he said, you know, you're one of the few who are able to get an education. I don't mean you take an education and do it yourself. See, the rest of the folks who are sacrificing for you to be here are doing so with the intention that you're going to come back with that education and improve the life of everyone. And to do that, you've got to base it in the African culture and then begin to transform the society. Now please, go to the library, check out this book, if they have the book, get the book, read chapter two, go online and get the file and read chapter two for tomorrow. And chapter two specifically is, how Africa developed before the coming of Europeans. And if there are no questions, I shall see everyone tomorrow at 3 o'clock, right before it is.